In 2013, there were a number of headlines around the world that proclaimed the startling statement that it was finally legal for women to wear pants in Paris. The genesis of these stories was a law that was promulgated 122 years ago today, on November 7, 1800, when the Paris Police Department dictated that any woman who wanted to wear trousers had to obtain a permit. This long-forgotten and antiquated law had been repealed, the story said, finally freeing the women of Paris to choose pantaloons over petticoats. And while there was a lot that was not quite accurate in how the story was told, there was a bit of truth there, because there are certainly laws all around the world that have not aged well, and others that always seem to have been a waste of government time and resources. And yet all these old and dumb laws do represent something about history. They talk about what was perceived as acceptable at the time, and that itself is history that deserves to be remembered. On January 31st, 2013, Najat Falud Belakim, France's Minister of Women's Rights, Minister of City Affairs, and Minister of Youth Affairs and Sports, released a statement saying that a 213-year-old Paris ordinance was incompatible with the principles of equality between women and men, which are listed in the Constitution and in France's European commitments. From that incompatibility follows the implicit abrogation of the ordinance. The statement resulted in headlines like that of the UK Independent on February 4, 2013. At last, women of Paris can wear the trousers legally after 200-year-old law is declared null and void. The issue stemmed from a law from the era of the French Revolution. The website Wonders and Marvels explains, On November 7, 1800, the Prefecture of Police for the City of Paris issued an order prohibiting women from wearing men's clothing in public noting that many women cross-dress, but not for health-related reasons, and that this behavior was a danger to themselves and others. The city order declared that any woman who wishes to dress as a man must present herself to the prefecture for authorization. The exact reason for the law is somewhat obscure, but the Atlantic magazine argues that the key was the sexism of the French Revolution. Pants signified not only default masculinity as the common uniform of the common man, the magazine writes, but they also symbolized the rise of the working class against the bourgeoisie. Female rebels at the time wanted the right to wear pants alongside their male counterparts. Banning women from trouser wearing was thus an effective way of banning them from the rank and file of the revolution and keeping them basically in their place. Over the course of the next 213 years, a small number, less than 200 or so, of women applied for such permits, many becoming momentary cause celeb for doing so. The law did evolve with the times. In 1892, the rule was amended to allow a woman to wear trousers without a permit if she was holding the reins of a horse, a sopped to the idea that, while possible to ride side saddle in a skirt, riding breeches are far more practical, and again was relaxed in 1909, so long as a woman was holding the handlebars of a bicycle, Likewise difficult to operate in a skirt and amid the growing popularity of bloomers, loose-fitting pantaloons named after American dress reformer Amelia Bloomer that had become all the rage among the bicycle-riding women of the world. The rule created something of a scandal as late as 1933, when film star Marlena Dietrich visited the city as she had a penchant for wearing pantaloons. In August, 1933 edition of the Pasadena Post reported, Marlena Dietrich, German actress, returned to Paris from Cannes on the Riviera tonight, wearing a striking pair of scarlet trousers. Man style. The public can't understand that I prefer to wear pants, she said petulantly at the demonstration of gazers. It is not an affectation. Of course, by 2013, the ordinance was comically outdated and almost certainly overridden by the French Constitution of October 27, 1946, which, among other things, guaranteed equality between men and women. But the entire story is somewhat misleading, as the French newspaper The Local explains. This was a decree, not a law, and a penalty is not mentioned. And as no woman ever seems to have been prosecuted under the rule, nor was there any penalty authorized had they been. While some women did seek and receive permits, the local rights, it seems that only a couple of hundred permits were ever issued, mostly to women who wished to cross-dress rather than women who wore trousers for practical or work-related reasons. Perhaps even more comically, the local notes that the rule was promulgated by the Prefecture du Police, so the minister's statement did not actually change anything, as formally withdrawing it would be a matter for the Paris Police Prefecture, which has shown no particular interest in doing so apparently because they consider the rule to be so obviously irrelevant that removing it is not worth the effort. 
But perhaps the worst part was that the headlines imply that Paris, a worldwide center for fashion, was uniquely quaint in its fashion rules. And it was not. Trouser bands of various sorts were common throughout much of the world, where women wearing what was perceived as men's attire was seen as a threat to society. Several anti-trouser ordinances were passed in the United States. Orlando, Florida passed one as late as 1907. Clothing reform was a significant issue for 19th century feminist movements, notably advocated in the U.S. by Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, the only woman ever to have received the Medal of Honor. The question of women's trousers and decorum is more recent than you might think, as the Lodi News Sentinel noted in famously progressive California, Rebecca Morgan became the first woman to wear trousers on the floor of the state Senate in 1989. At the time, fellow Senator Rose Ann Volch, the first woman elected to the California State Senate, said that when I got here 12 years ago, the fellows gave me a sermon and told me they wanted me to dress like a lady and not wear pants. Still, California was ahead of the nation. A rule preventing women from wearing trousers on the floor of the United States Senate was not amended until four years later. The issue still resonates. The East African Republic of Sudan only repealed laws that allowed morality police to publicly flog women for wearing trousers in 2020. In other words, the largely symbolic 2013 announcement that the Paris women's trouser ban was no longer applicable was more than just an anachronistic bit of humor. It actually represented nearly two centuries of social progress. If regulating women's pants seems an odd use of resources, the idea is certainly not unique. It's easy to find lists of silly laws, although some of those turned out to be urban legends rather than statutes. In his 2010 book, Strange and Curious Legal Oddities, author Nathan Bolofsky writes, Some laws are just plain dumb, the result of accident or mistake, while others are born of malice, the handiwork of petty dictators devoted to taking away our freedoms or our fun, and often enforced by bloated bureaucracies whose very survival depends upon the creation of new and more laws. Bolofsky presents copious examples. It's illegal to throw candy from a float during a parade in Grand Forks, North Dakota. A law in Maine prohibits sea urchins and lobsters from being together aboard boats. And I guess we can all agree that it's not a hybrid that any of us want to see. You cannot carry an unconcealed slingshot in Deadwood, South Dakota, nor are you allowed to use psychic powers or necromancy. It's illegal to use yo-yos to fish in South Carolina. But laws can also be a window into history. Bolofsky continues, Other strange laws made sense long ago, but now serve only to provide a fascinating glimpse into times and cultures long past. You can suppose that a Rhode Island law against stealing stone walls made perfect sense at some point, as perhaps as their statutory cat identification program. Professor Kelly Miles of the Marquette University Law School notes, In Alabama, it's illegal to train bears to wrestle. Why anyone would need to know that it is illegal in order to refrain from doing it is a puzzling, but apparently bears wrestling men was a popular sport in the 1800s, and because of its danger, Alabama enacted a law to prohibit such an act. But it is difficult to find a legislative effort that seems more absurd than New Hampshire's revised code, Title I, Chapter 3, Section 7, State Songs. NewHampshire.gov, the official New Hampshire government website, explains New Hampshire has the unusual distinction of having nine state songs, with one of them being official and others honorary. This came about by legislative votes or a quarter of a century and was finally agreed upon in the 1977 session, although it turns out the website is somewhat behind. The statute now includes ten rather than nine state songs. The legislative process to add such a catalog of composition was complex. The official state song, Old New Hampshire, composed in 1926 with music by Maurice Hoffman Jr. and lyrics by Dr. John F. Holmes, was first proposed to the New Hampshire legislature in 1941, but the bill was defeated. The song that starts with a skill that knows no measure from the golden store of fate, God in his great love and wisdom made the rugged granite state, finally made it through the legislature, being designated the state song in 1949. In 2007, fourth grade band director Deb Nealon said of it, it's kind of archaic. If two bills already seems an excessive for a state song, and actually there were three, as a 1943 bill that proposed a public contest to choose a state song was defeated, the legislature added New Hampshire, My New Hampshire, by Julius Richardson and Walter P. Smith of Plymouth as a second state song in 1963. The Concord Monitor dryly noted in 2001, records don't tell why we couldn't stick with just one anthem. 
Still, two songs being apparently insufficient use of the legislature's time, New Hampshire Hills was added as a third state song a decade later. And who wouldn't love a song that proclaims that New Hampshire men are brawny men, New Hampshire girls are kind, New Hampshire folk are friendly folk, as ever you will find. At some point, it seems like the legislature may have recognized that enough is enough. A 1975 bill to add a song named merely New Hampshire failed. The West Lebanon Valley News reported to, at the time that a somewhat sheepish Senator Roger A. Smith told his fellow senators last week, I didn't realize that there were already three other state songs when he agreed to sponsor the composition. Senator Robert F. Bossie of Manchester stated bluntly that three state songs were enough for him. Still, the newspaper opined, while New Hampshire leaves much to be desired as poetry, it doesn't compare unfavorably to the three existing state songs. But the mood apparently changed in 1977, when the legislature added a fourth state song, Autumn in New Hampshire, which includes the line, The air is crispy, and the horses frisky. But at the same time, finally recognizing that having multiple state songs was confusing, the Nashua Telegraph noted the dilemma over having three official state songs, but nothing to play at formal state occasions. Rather than stopping the practice of adding state songs, the legislature decided to create a board responsible for choosing one state song while listing the additional state songs as honorary state songs. The State Song Selection Board was coordinated by the Right Honorable Representative Richardson D. Benton of Chester chairman of the House Committee on Public Protection and Veterans Affairs. The board consisted of five members, three appointed by the governor and one each by the Senate president and the House speaker. But the legislature did not apparently quite trust this board as three months after the board began its august deliberations, the legislature passed yet another act, adding four more songs. New Hampshire's Granite State, Oh New Hampshire You're My Home, the Old Man of the Mountain, and the New Hampshire State March to the list of official state songs, stipulating that any not selected by the board as the official state song would be added to the list of honorary state songs. The Old Man of the Mountains and New Hampshire's Granite State both reference a sad bit of history lost, a rock formation that was designated the official state emblem in 1945, well, fell off the mountain in 2003. Finally, after months of study and hours of heart-wrenching decision-making, the board came to the conclusion that the original state song, Old New Hampshire, should be the state song. Raising the question of why you even needed a board to do that, it seems like the functional equivalent of asking the poor person at the counter at Baskin Robbins to list all 31 flavors and then just choosing a scoop of vanilla. On a tragic note, as the Telegraph laments, the touring group that was supposed to sing the new or rather old, state song as a celebration of the board's decision was unable to make it, their bus having broken down in Connecticut. But even the monumental efforts of the 1977 State Song Selection Board left the state insufficiently anthemed, with a mere eight state songs necessitating, of course, the addition of a ninth in 1983. The Concord Monitor wrote, The Shaw Brothers, a popular folk-singing duo, came out with a catchy ditty called New Hampshire Naturally and the legislature wasted no time in adopting it. As the Shaw brothers proclaim, I know what it is to be New Hampshire high. But apparently nine state songs was not enough. In 2007, a tenth song was added, Live Free or Die. The Concord Monitor reported on February 25, 2007, that Representative Dave Smith of Nashua proposed the addition, arguing that the song had a knack for sticking in your head and is very easy to sing. Moreover, he notes, while other state songs focus on the aesthetic beauty of the state, this song focuses on the history. And, he argues, the other nine songs are dull. The state song should have singability, some kind of hook, he argues. The process of adding another state song, however, requires effort. For example, the monitor explains a group of fourth graders from Birchill Elementary School in Nashua traveled to the state capitol in Concord to sing Live Free or Die to two different legislative committees a process that would, if passed, have to be repeated for the full House, the full Senate, and the Governor. The choir director noted, it's a civics lesson and a music lesson, too. But is the state served by so many state songs? Peter Wellner, a library director for the Historical Society, told The Telegraph that having state symbols can serve as a reminder of what makes each state unique. But Anna Ackerman, associate professor of education at River College in Nashua, warned that at 10 songs, there's a risk of having too many. And the Concord Monitor noted in 2001 that these days, for all our abundance of anthems, most of us have never sung a one of them. 
Ackerman, herself a historian at a university in New Hampshire, told The Telegraph, I didn't even know we had honorary songs. That failure is not apparently unique. A columnist in the Valley News in 1999 noted that just for fun, I telephoned the governor's offices in Montpelier and Concord and asked the person who answered if they knew the first line of their state song. One of them stammered, the other one chuckled, and both of them acknowledged, no, I don't. And the Valley News writes, none of them have ever set the state humming. The Monitor opined, the anthems range from sentimental to snappy to downright smarmy. Composed by poet laureates, musicians, and regular New Hampshire folks, most of them ooze images of another era. It's important to note that many of the online lists of dumb laws are misinterpretations or outright lies. A commission in 2013 in England and Wales, for example, looking at laws, found that one that often makes those lists, a purported law that said that it is legal to shoot a Welshman with a longbow on Sunday in Hereford, is an urban myth with no basis in fact. But they did clarify, however, that it is in fact a law in the United Kingdom that you may not wear a suit of armor in Parliament. And if you think that New Hampshire has gone crazy with its state songs, you might be surprised to find out that they don't actually hold the record. Tennessee, where songwriting is the state art form, just approved its 11th state song, I'll Leave My Heart in Tennessee, last spring. And if nothing else, these dumb laws do, you know, entertain. And they do say something about sensibilities of the time. For example, like New Hampshire, Tennessee's growing list of state songs, although they have seemed to have chosen more catchy tunes, things like Rocky Top and even a bicentennial state rap, do represent something about culture and history, even if some of those songs seem as out of date as a ban on women wearing pants. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.